Lord is good, even when it's 20 degrees outside. Amen. Let's lift our hands right now and ask the Lord to bless. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your mercy, Lord God. Thank you for your mercy, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this building, Lord. You're a great God. Help us to commit ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. Help us commit ourselves to you, Lord God. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you, Lord God. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Blessed is your name, Lord God. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus. Holy is your name, Jesus. Holy is your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for blessing your people tonight, Lord. Thank you for blessing your people tonight. Anoint the word tonight. Bless our young people, our young adults, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. Oh, speak to us in every level, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Let's just continue what we started in the prayer hall and worship tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We magnify your name this evening. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We worship and magnify you tonight, Lord. And we welcome your presence here in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name.
Continue in that, continue in that vein. Hallelujah. This next song is called Oceans. Hallelujah. Wanting the Spirit of the Lord to lead, the Spirit of the Lord to guide. Personally, I love this song because it's talking about trusting in God. As Peter did when God beckoned him to come out of the boat, he stepped out and stepped on the water. No, he wasn't perfect because he started sinking. But it was when he got his eyes refocused back on the Lord and he called out to the Lord that God began to reach, pull him up. And I don't know about you and uh, everything that Pastor Sean and, and, and Pastor has been preaching, talking about supernatural things. And I, I just, I want to see that come to pass. I want that to happen, not just within the church body, but I want it to happen in me in my world, in my workplace, where I go. I don't want it to be just something that's preached, something that's taught, something that's even read, but I want it to be made manifest in my everyday walk. And that's, that's gonna be key because he can preach, the word can go forth, but it's until the word gets activated in us individually and it becomes manifest in us that we see it and it happens and so as we sing this song tonight can it be a prayer that we're calling out to the lord that lord i want you to call me out upon the water call me out into the unknown those places that i may not be able to see with my own eyes but to simply trust you spirit lead me hallelujah can't see but we can still worship amen Thank you, Jesus. You called me out upon the waters. Oh, sir. Thank you. Where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery. In oceans deep. My faith will stay, and I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves, where oceans rise, my soul will rest in your feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stay and I will call upon your My soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. God, you're my personal God. You're my personal Savior. Hallelujah, Lord. Yes, you are. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. 
where feet may fail and fear surrounds me. You never fail and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name. God, we call upon your name, Jesus. Keep my eyes above the way. Keeping our eyes focused on you. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. my personal God and my personal Savior. It's helping us, God, to keep our focus and our eyes set on you so that, Lord God, where you lead, we will follow. When you say to speak, God, we will speak. When you say, telling us, God, where to go, that we will go. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. upon the waters wherever you would call me Spirit, lead God Take me deeper than my feet would ever God, we may trust you, Lord And my faith will be Hallelujah. stronger Hallelujah. In the presence of Can we say that as I pray? I say praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord is good, isn't he? Amen. And man, I want to tell you what, it is cold outside. It is more than cold outside. And I think it's supposed to get Yeah, it's colder. 
Amen. Well, praise the Lord for that. At least it's not cold in here, or at least it's not really cold in here. One of the two. Amen. Well, I do want to make, make sure everybody's aware that if you have a junior high uh, student or a senior high student, or if you, you shouldn't be in here if you're a young adult, uh, married or single, uh, 30 and under, uh, but if you are in any of those families, then immediately after the service in the youth center, you can get a hold of the book, Worth the Wait, and for the junior high and senior high students, a permission slip, uh, it's not really a permission slip, it's more of, a, it's more of a, an, under, a, an understanding page <laughs> that acknowledges uh, that your student um, has your consent to be in the class. That's just a, a way that we're all just working together. And there won't be anything talked about in the class that you as parents will not be aware of because you'll be pre-reading the chapter with your students uh, the week prior to the lesson being given. And so if there's any questions or fears, worries, doubts, unbeliefs, concerns, then we can help address those prior to the session. <coughs> and we're in 2015, I think. Amen. It feels like we're already about six months in, doesn't it? Kind of weird, but uh, it is the first Wednesday night um, of the new year, and I know it's really sad. Sorry, I apologize. It's, he's so upset about the fact. Got to get older. Amen. Uh, but we are, we are here, and we are endeavoring to become. Everybody say, I'm endeavoring to become. It's very important because God is positioning us to be used in a greater way than we've ever been used before. And you know what? We can keep saying that until the trumpet sounds because however much we are used in Him doesn't compare to how much He can continue to use us and how much we can be used in the kingdom. And so that never ends. That process of growing and that process of becoming and that process of transforming and that process of being more like Him is an ongoing, never-ending process. We never, never make it until we are changed to be like Him. At the sound of the trumpet, at the twinkling of an eye, we're called up to meet Him and we are changed. Everybody say, I can't wait to be changed. Hallelujah. And so we are in this pursuit, <clears throat> this pursuit of apprehending what we have on the inside. We have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost by evidence of speaking in tongues, shout amen. amen. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost by evidence of speaking in tongues, it is to be desired in your life. Something to seek after in your life. To be ever consumed by the Spirit of God. And to have... The Spirit of the Lord reside in us. That is the infilling of the Spirit of God. It's the New Testament covenant of the Old Testament tabernacle where the Spirit of God resided in the Ark of the Covenant and was with the children of Israel throughout their existence. God said, I want to be with you. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God says, I want to be in you. And that temple that followed and, and was a part of the children of Israel, now we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And now the Holy Ghost resides in us. Can somebody say hallelujah for that? When we look at the subject of practical holiness, and we certainly, when we look at it now, we're switching gears a little bit here, and we have ramped up over eight or nine sessions. <clears throat> We've ramped up over eight or nine sessions to understand the value of our walk with God, and we are unfolding that value piece by piece. We are now going to get into some more practical aspects 
of holiness. And so when we look at the subject of practical holiness, of dress, standards, the constant question has always been and will always be for the unbeliever and the one who likes to walk the line and the one who's not really interested in everything that God has for them. It will be, why bother with this kind of stuff? Or who cares anyway? These are the questions that, that come up in our conversations when we address, address the standards of holiness in practical ways. Who cares and why bother with it anyway? The answer should always be found in the Bible, and it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19, the Bible says, what's the first word when we get it up there? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. <coughs> All right. The question, the first word is a question, God says, what? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye, <laughs> it really is, this is the third time that this has happened tonight. It's just because we're talking about holiness. Even the building doesn't want to hear about it. <laughs> the scripture says, <laughs> what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And here's the result of that. Ye are not your own. For you are bought, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 6, you are bought with a price. And here's the result of that purchase. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Say, they're not mine anymore. Say, they're not mine anymore. They're God's. My body's not my body anymore, it's God's body. And I am to glorify Him with my body, in my body. So the question we have to notice in this verse really in the beginning is this. Are we His or not? We have been purchased. By the blood of Calvary, therefore, he says, by virtue of the purchase of the blood at Calvary, he says, therefore, I am to glorify him in both spirit and body. After the new birth experience, after the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in tongues, baptism of the water, in the name of Jesus Christ, we become God's property. And this is the greatest hurdle to personal spiritual growth in the life of, of the human being. It's the issue of personal sovereignty. This is the greatest hurdle in becoming a subject unto our Creator, submitting our will to a higher authority, and following after the guidelines, the commandments, and the precepts given by Scripture and the principles that are laid out because 
most of the time it goes against our human will when we have not fully submitted ourselves to God. Can somebody say amen to them? First Corinthians chapter, are we back up and running again? First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 22, we notice that Paul said, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also, he that is called being free is Christ's servants. servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. He is calling us to follow after him and not follow after mankind. The scriptures are not written by accident, they're written on purpose. Can somebody say amen to that? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When we read these scriptures about practical holiness in how we look and how we dress and how we act and how we talk and how we respond, we are getting it from the scriptures. The scriptures were given through the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Doing what, What's the result of this? Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Verse 15 of that of Hebrews chapter 12 goes with 14 because of the definition of holiness. Remember, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 15 says, looking diligently, paying close attention to myself, lest I fail. I don't want to fail. And that there be any root of bitterness that would trouble me and cause me to be defiled. So being in a state of holiness and maintaining myself and following hard after God eliminates the possibility of bitterness springing up in my life, being defiled as a result, and failing in God. If I am concentrated on Him, pleasing Him, following hard after Him, honoring Him, and glorifying Him, I don't have time to become bitter with my brother or my sister. I don't have time to find fault uh, with my brother and my sister and don't have time for trouble to be a part of my life. Holiness is the state of being holy. And holy is spiritual purity. This tells us God wants us to be spiritually pure and that we are to follow after peace and holiness. We're supposed to follow that. That's supposed to lead us. Peace with all men, I'm supposed to follow that. Holiness, I'm supposed to follow that. Following means to ensue, to press forward or pursue. I am to pursue a life of peace with my fellow man. And I'm supposed to follow and pursue holiness unto God. God has indeed, throughout his scriptures, called us to holiness, both inner holiness, which we have spent some time on, and outer holiness. And each one, the inner and the outer, each one can destroy the other if we're not careful. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 15, the Bible says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation is a two-way street. It's both what I say and what I hear. Otherwise, it's a monologue. And that is not a conversation. A conversation is a dialogue. 
It's back and forth. It's give and take. He's saying here, be holy not only in the things that you say, but be holy in the things that you hear. Because it is written, verse 16, be ye holy for I am holy. We can see that holiness is not optional. So we must explore it. We must figure it out. We must get our hands on it. We must embrace it and figure it out in our life because holiness is not optional. If God says, I'm holy and I'm asking, I'm telling you to be holy. He's not asking. He says, be holy. <laughs> That's pretty much of a command. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And I say that because we have him in us that we can become holy by that fact. So it must be uh, explored. Holiness, we must understand, is not outward dogma. It is not, it is not an outward position. It is conforming to God's character. The New Testament talks of being transformed and conformed. And, and maybe uh, it's easier to, to look at it this way. To be transformed could be seen as the process. To be conformed can be seen as the result. And on our spiritual journey, sooner or later, God will bring you down this path of transformation and conformity to Him. The word holy, when we read the Bible, occurs some 600 times. <coughs> the book of Leviticus, it's, it's really the very theme of that book. So when we look at holiness from a scriptural bird's eye view, Holiness, in a nutshell, is being separated unto God and having our conduct befitting those who are separated. It should not be a question if we are of the separated ones. It shouldn't be, I think you are, I'm not sure you are. Because holiness is being separated unto God. There is no reason for holiness if there is no sin. That's why in the Garden of Eden there was no separation. There was no the nakedness. There was innocence totally 100%. It was only when the knowledge of good and evil became, they became conscious of that that they had to separate themselves from that and they needed to be clothed. There was no knowledge of it. And from that point on, there was need for purity in their life. From that point on, humanity needed to be separated unto God. From that point on. And as time... We should do, we should have done a drama. In time, the separation has become more and more apparent because sin has become more and more prevalent. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1, the reason why we are separated to God and we have conduct befitting those who are separated is because we are heirs. There, therefore, further, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received, that, that as ye have received of us how we ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. We're not going to read on there even though it says it. He's saying, I exhort you, just as you have received from us, how to walk and to please God. The reason is, is so you will, you will 
abound more and more in your walk with God. <coughs> and that one concept sums it all up. Because we are His, we want to please Him. And that should be our prayer every day. God, I want to please You because I love You. I want to honor You because I love You. I want to honor you in my speech because I love you. I want to honor you in my conduct because I love you. I want to honor you in my look because I love you. I want to honor you in my dress because I love you. I want to be separated unto you. It is not much unlike, and it is not unlike a marriage. When we are married, it's the same concept. We live separated unto our spouse and we start doing things as a result of being married and we stop doing things as a result of being married we become transformed right come on somebody and our world is against even that kind of transformation. Oh, you got to ask permission. Oh, you got to make a phone call to find out if you can or you cannot. Who is the man of the household? Who is the woman? You need to tell your man what, what, where to go and who you are. Stuff like that. I can't even think of those things because they're so far from my world that I can't even give you good examples. But I don't, I don't conduct myself like I did 22 years ago. I've been conformed into the image of a married man. Come on, somebody. <coughs> My wife, I didn't know her 24 years ago. <laughs> I don't know what she was like. Sure glad I got her, though. But we are, we are in the process, when we first get married, we certainly automatically recognize there are some things that we don't do anymore. We don't go out on dates anymore with other women or other men. Right? Right? That's pretty obvious. We don't, we, we don't spend the night at somebody else's house, our buddy's house, on, on night three of our marriage. Or any other night, unless with consent and for reason and purpose, blah, blah, blah. You understand what I'm saying. Right? We don't, we are being transformed. There, unfortunately, just like in the transformation in our spiritual lives, it takes some married people a long time to figure out I'm supposed to conform to some new image. And it causes much conflict in the relationship when transformation is not embraced. Transformation to conformity is not embraced. In our world, even in the simplistic example of a married couple, our world fights against even that type of honoring of a relationship. How much more is the world fighting against the relationship between us and our Creator when we are in the process of being transformed into His image and conformed to His character? First Thessalonians 5 and 22. Uh, so the question, before I read that, the question is, are we more interested in pleasing self than God? I go back to my example of marriage. If I am more interested in pleasing my wife than I am myself, and she's more interested in pleasing me than she is herself, then both of us are going to receive exactly what each other needs in our life. I cannot give myself what I need. That's why I married her. Because I lack. I was deficient. 
and I needed her. Just like in our relationship with God, I can't save myself, and I need him. I'm deficient in the ability for me to be helped. I need him. But if I become more interested in pleasing myself, then I become interested in pleasing her, then my marriage relationship will start to crumble and fall apart. Just as if I am more interested in pleasing myself than I am in pleasing God, then my spiritual relationship will start to fall apart. And I will begin, just like in the natural, I'll begin to blame her. Just like in the spiritual, I begin to blame God. And the whole point comes back to a selfish attitude of self-indulgence and wanting everything about me. And I turn it around to be everybody else's problem and not my problem. So we have to ask ourselves in terms of holiness, in terms of practical holiness, in standards and dress and conduct. Uh, am I more interested in pleasing myself, the way I look, the way I feel, how it makes me feel, how it makes other people look at me, how I am perceived by other people, or am I more interested in pleasing God? 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearances of evil. He's not even saying abstain from evil. He's saying abstain from the very appearance of evil. He's saying that there's going to be some things that are not evil that look evil. And he's saying you have to be the judge of that based upon our relationship. Abstain from it. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Stay away from the very appearance of evil. If you are a female, which you're not, you're all man. Um, it's important that if I was to address you, that I don't address you like this. See? Right? I can't, I can't, ooh, yeah, here's a good opportunity. <laughs> I must abstain from all appearances of evil. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's a big pain in the neck, isn't it? Because that puts all the responsibility on me, even if it's your fault. I have to be very aware. I have to be very conscious of every moment of my day and my action and what it would appear to look like. When I was a kid, um, I don't know if it's popular anymore, um, but uh, they had uh, candy cigarettes. I'm sure they still sell them. I assume they do. And I, and I got a hold of a couple of them cigarettes, candies, and, and man, I tried to hold them every single way that I saw was cool. What was the deal with that? There was something that, you know, that fleshly side would call you to uh, want to mimic and look like what the world says was popular. I'll never forget, I don't know, it's just all coming back to me right now. There was a way this one guy used to hold it. <laughs> or the old-fashioned way, just right up there. idea anyway the problem is that from any distance away from me 10 or more feet away from me it was near impossible to tell whether that was candy or not now I can't help it that you thought it was candy that's your problem but God says it's actually my problem You know, there's nothing wrong with um, crushed ice, strawberry, orange, 
mixed together in a slushy. Man. And then on top of that, a little umbrella. And, and maybe a, maybe a, 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 a slice of orange. And then, if I got time, put a bunch of salt around the top. And, man, it's good. It's sweet. It's refreshing. It's, it's beautiful. It's just nice. You know what I'm saying? You ever had one of those? We make them, we make them a lot in the, in the house. We don't put the salt on very often, like ever. But you understand what I'm saying? That would be called a uh, not a Shirley Temple. Yeah. Or a virgin daiquiri. Right? Nothing, nothing wrong with the contents of it. The contents are actually okay, right? But when they come in a nice glass, and I'm sitting across the restaurant, and you walk in and you see me slurping on that thing, what is the very, one of the very things that run through your head like a, like a speeding horse? Man, he needs a driver. And so the responsibility as sin becomes more and more pervasive in our world, our responsibility actually raises. It actually becomes more on us. Is it fair? I don't know if it's fair or not. I don't know. Because I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about following him. Whether it's fair or not, I don't know. If I want to have a strawberry daiquiri, then I'll have one at home. I don't need to have one in the same glass, in the same appearance as the guy next to me that's half drunk. Because I cannot afford on multiple levels, but the main level, which we haven't got to yet, I cannot afford for someone to associate me with a group of people that I am not associated with. I can't afford that because my obligation is that I would proclaim something through my actions and my look. That's my obligation. My obligation is that he would be known through me. And if I am doing an activity or I am involved in something that would take me and put me into another category or another group, that is on me. Come on, girl. That's, that's right. We want to, not only the appearance of action, but the appearance of words. So, yes, I apologize. Thank you. Obviously, that shows my ignorance. You can all come over and have a strawberry slushy. The daiquiri will have, doesn't exist. Right? The daiquiri makes it alcohol. Yeah. All right. Whatever it is, you know what we don't have or drink. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. We can change our conduct, but only God can change our heart. You see, outer holiness... Without inner holiness is self-righteousness, which is, as the Bible calls, filthy rags. And filthy rags are useless. So we have to remember balance 
is what we are looking for, right? Balance is what we are looking for. As I said, I think, maybe I didn't say it to this to you, uh, but on either end of the spectrum of holiness, we can be backslid. We can be so loose in our holiness that we're backslid. And we can be so stringent in our holiness that it becomes self-righteousness and we're backslid. So we have to strike the balance in the middle uh, of living for God. Now, at the same time as I just said we have to strike the balance, we have to recognize that there's no in-between. Now figure that one out. Because we belong to either God or Satan. So there's no in-between in that. We belong to God or we belong to Satan. He, the scripture says that Jesus said, hey, you're of your father the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14, this is very important. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what accord hath Christ with Belial or Satan? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And here it is, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There's a lot there, folks. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I don't need to go on a sidetrack here. But presenting our bodies is not an issue of bodybuilding or even being involved in every health fad. God does not get glory out of us being unhealthy. We know that. Okay? It's in the middle. Neither does it get us glory in being overly healthy. Okay? <laughs> he does not really get glory out of our health either way. Because there will always be people that are fat and skinny, smart and simple, rich and poor, sick and well, short and tall in the world and in the church. So when we talk about presenting our bodies, we're not saying, look how much I lost. We certainly recognize that bodily exercise profiteth little. My favorite scripture. 1 Timothy 4.8 Bodily exercise profiteth little, but, here he goes and saying now, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. When we live a holy life and there is godliness, it is a taste of the fullness that we are going to experience when we step over on the other side. And I can't wait for that. How about you? All right. When we, we have, and we got just a little bit of time left, I want to get through... Uh, something here. Um, when we come to God and when we tell people that we've come to God or we have lived a life pleasing unto God, there are going to be people that think holiness stuff is, uh, I think the theological word is, they're going to think holiness stuff is stupid or unneeded. 
And they will say things like, it was all taken care of on the cross. And there's no need. You are earning. You're trying to earn a relationship with God. You're trying to uh, be saved by works and, and, and things like that. We have to be very, very sure and uh, very understanding of the scriptures and the principles that we're not earning anything by being holy. We are showing. We're not earning. We're showing our commitment and our love to our God. Just like we do in our marriages. I'm not earning anything from my wife by conducting myself as a married man. I'm not earning anything. I'm showing her something. I'm showing her my commitment level to her. How much I love her. How much I honor her. How much I adore her. How much I worship the ground she walks on. How much, whether it's in the early morning or the late at night, I love her. Whether I'm in a good mood, a bad mood, she's in a good mood or a bad mood, I have decided that I'm going to honor her and love her and love her and love her and love her. Even if she doesn't love me back. Because this is not about me. This is about her. She'll have, she'll have to deal with that with God if she does not love me. If it's all about her, she'll have to deal with that and she'll be miserable all her life. I'm not going to be miserable. So holiness stuff for some people is stupid. That's the theological word. But so do they, they also think that Acts 2.38 is stupid too. But we can't be so quick to judge things before we have sincerely sought God on them. We have to remember that God is our law giver. Obedience is required of us. If it pleases God, it doesn't matter who it displeases. Or if it displeases God, it doesn't matter who it pleases. We have to remember that. Even though we wrestle with our flesh, God has given us a mind and a heart to cooperate with his spirit. We're going to wrestle against our flesh. Our world is inundated, in, inundating us with its value system and our flesh is designed to desire it. That's why we have to be subjected to his spirit and we have to cooperate with his spirit to keep our flesh under control. <coughs> we should make every effort to make obedient choices in terms of holiness. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 12 it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasures. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Man, that's an awesome, awesome uh, couple of verses there. He's saying, be consistently obedient. He's saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling or with sincerity. Not, not in trepidation, <coughs> not in anxiousness, but in sincerity. That's what that is meaning there. This is the shortcoming of our modern Christian culture. Is that we don't have some, we don't have people that are really seeking sincerely 
to please God. And when they hit a brick wall or they hit something that goes against their flesh or they hit something that is made fun of, then they crumble and fall. Obey his word without complaining. And this is why, because we will shine like lights to this world. Reasonable standards. Everybody say reasonable. Reasonable standards bring glory to God by distinguishing his people on earth. What is a standard? I'm going to close with this. What is a standard? A standard specifically is a banner or a flag that identifies you. It represents your nation's customs, philosophies, and lifestyles. In battle, it distinguishes the sides. And when we talk about our church, our church standards represents the values and the convictions that we have to our city. When we raise a standard, we are saying these are our customs, philosophies, and lifestyles. And these are our values and our convictions to a world that is lost and seeking. Why would I look for something different when all I see is the same thing? The value of a standard is so that you stand out. And you become a magnet, a light, a beacon for the Lord to do a work through. Reasonable, though, I want to leave you with this, reasonable standards. Reasonable standards bring glory to God. Now, it's very important in two weeks, very important that you hang on to that phrase, reasonable standards bring glory to God, because we have to figure out what's reasonable. Right? Amen. Uh, such as, but when you all have been sitting in here, we have taken all of your vehicles and we have replaced them with horse and carriage. That is reasonable. You understand what I'm saying? Hello? That's not reasonable, right? It would certainly cause you to stand out. But you have to ask yourself, at that point, what are they looking at? Because, could somebody put another quarter in that, please? Thank you. There is absolutely no explanation as to why it is doing that. There's none. There is no explanation. And that is irritating me. So when we get back together, we're going to answer the question, why bother with standards why bother at all? Why bother? There's four reasons why we should bother with standards, but I don't want to get into them because of the time, and I don't want to leave you halfway. So it's very important that when we discuss these things, we are not discussing them flippantly. When we are disseminating what we feel the principle of God to a congregation that is designed to be a light to a lost and dying world, 
We're not doing this just because we sit around all day long in our own little cave and we don't have interaction with the world and we want everyone to be like us. That's very important for you to know. That we don't, we don't deal, it must be because we don't deal with the same environment or the same culture of people that everybody else deals with so we can come up with these crazy things. No. Out of the principles of the word of God, they have to be reasonable in the day and the time and the culture in which we live so that we can still maintain a level of separateness while we allow for there to be evangelism into a lost world. There has to be a calling from one side to another side. There has to be a distinguishing mark between those that are of his name and those that are not. There must be a standard that identifies and, calcu and is calculated by visual experience. There has to be. That's what a standard is. That it gives the enemy and it gives the same side. The ability that at a glance, they know where they are and they know in whom they believe. Amen. Let's stand. We have to hurry before the lights go out again. I want to be the kind of person that God wants me to be. I want to be the kind of person that he can count on to be identified by. I want to be that kind of person. And it is all encompassing. That's why he said, I pray this, that you're sanctified holy. It's the WH, it's the whole person, our whole being, it's our, it's everything about us. It's what we ingest, it's what we exhale, it's what we speak, it's what we hear, it's what we look at, it's where we put our hands, it's how we walk, it's how we conversate, it's what we look like, it's what we put on, it's everything about us identifies us as a part of a separate group now you don't have to worry about us going too far separate that we, we tip the scale the other way and it becomes a self righteous issue you don't have to worry about that what we will always fight against is being too far the other way of losing something and then we cannot become distinguished from the world we won't be able to. And what we end up doing is we end up just coming to church and maintaining a church level, a room level of holiness. And nobody can identify with us. Because they come into the building and we're not the same people that they met. And we ask them to do something that we're not doing. And so we have to, we have to sanctify ourselves holy that's what that's what the reboot is all about the reboot is about getting our attention about things uh, that need sanctifying purity to purify things in our life so that every facet of our being is positioned to glorify our heavenly father amen let's lift our hands thank you Jesus we love you Lord God you're good to us Lord Oh, hallelujah. We ask, God, that you would touch us, Lord Jesus. That you would continue to call us, Lord Jesus. That, Lord God, that we would be in that process of transformation and conforming unto your image, God, and character. That, Lord Jesus, as we are journeying in this, that if we uh, are made aware of, God, if we're made aware of items, we're made aware of positions, we're made aware of things in our life that need to change so that we can be more identified with you God help us to have what it takes on the inside to make those adjustments Lord Jesus help us Lord God to have what it takes in order to make those adjustments so that we can be more like you God 
For we see the revival coming, God. We see the revival coming. And we want, Lord, them to see you and not us. We want their vision to pass right through us and to see an all-merciful and all-graceful and all-victorious and all-powerful God, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you believe that and receive that, why don't you say amen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Amen. And I want to, I want to be a part of changing somebody's life. I want to be a part of changing somebody's life. I can't change their life, but I can be a part. I got a little role in that because they got to see him through me. Amen.